Thank you for serving our kids and, and giving us some information about, you know, the Negro Leagues and your grandfather. So I, I look absolutely forward to this, this conversation. So I appreciate it. Oh, great. So now you're the uh, baseball fanatic. Is that a huge Sox fan? Uh, OK. So, you know, as a South Side Chicagoan, uh, you know, we South Siders take pride in a couple things. We take pride in Harold's Chicken and we take pride in our work. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so uh, and so it's one of the things that that I love and that connected me to just being a South Sider. You know, growing up on the South Side, literally you could walk. To, I couldn't walk to, to the Comiskey. But, you know, I just remember as a kid, it was my first introduction to baseball. And OK. My, my parents taking me to games in old Comiskey. Yeah, I'm a little bit older. Uh, they built the new one when I was in like eighth grade, though. So, you know. Okay. All right. So, and I, I remember just that experience, just being with my parents and my mom taking me when I was a kid. And, and so, and just like the natural love of baseball. And then you also remember figures like for White Sox, like Frank Thomas, Bo Jackson, mm -hmm. um, you know, I could even go back as like Bobby Bonilla. Uh, and so you remember players like that. And you just was like, that's my team. So. <laughs> I understand. It's interesting. I grew up on the South Side before moving to Michigan. I went to uh, grammar school in, in the uh, Chicago area, in Chicago, and then had some gang issues. And we moved to Michigan when I went to high school. But being on the South Side, you would have thought I would have been a Sox fan. But my dad grew up with Billy Williams. And Billy is a, mo a mobile whistler boy like my granddad and my father. And so when Billy was playing for the Cubs, naturally, you know, he and my dad were real close. And, you know, back in that day, my dad, who was a bricklayer like his father, my grandfather, mm -hmm. was making as much money as Billy was making playing for the Cubs. Yeah. Matter of fact, Billy didn't have a car when my dad had a car. He'd be borrowing my dad's car. So the bottom line is I spent most of my youth at uh, Wrigley Field because, you know, it's free tickets. I could ride with Billy and, you uh -huh. know, get a nice seat. So I grew up really a Cubs fan. But, I'll, you know, I don't root against the Sox. Uh, except when they play the Cubs. Other than that, I'm well. I'm, I'm not an evil Cubs fan, <laughs> so I have matured as an adult. Okay. When I was younger, I was the kid that was not kid, but I was the young adult that was cheering Bartman when he when he in. <laughs> but I have matured some since then because what I have found is that you know fans are are people and humans, and so I would have like. Some of my closest friends were Cub, friend, Cub fans. Okay. This guy, Hector Morales, I used to go to church with. Uh, he was an avid Cub fan. And so you appreciated when the Cubs won because it made him happy. Okay. So as you, you mature and you're like, you know, maybe the whole like rooting for Bartman, rooting for their pain is not. <laughs> and I had also my secretary at Larkin. Miss Sarbaugh, Donna Sarbaugh, she was a an avid Cup fan and loved the Cup. So there's no oh, okay. way you could continue to, to root against the Cup, especially when you know that some of your closest people uh, love them and are diehard Cup fans. So absolutely, well, that's I'm good. That's, sure that's the right perspective to have. Absolutely, I've matured a little bit, you know, but <laughs> uh, I still won't. I still won't wear a jersey or I have. I do have a Cubs hat when they won the World Series. I did buy a Cubs hat, you know. Okay, all right. In honor of my of my secretary Donna. She was. Like, oh, well, good, good, good. I, I'm sure I've got something that says socks that I'll break out every now and then, but right, uh, it still shows. You know, I'm I'm a Chicagoan and things like that. So. Right, absolutely. So I have an introduction that I have to read. So let me, because I'll, I'll read the introduction. Okay. About your grandfather, uh, legendary third baseman Bobby Robinson was born on October 25th, 1903. He grew up in Whistler, in, a, in Whistler, a town outside of Mobile, Alabama, with fellow Negro League baseball player Satchel Page and Ted Double Duty Ratcliffe. Robinson was scouted for the Negro League while playing baseball with the semi-professional Pensacola Giants. The Giants made a trip to Birmingham, Alabama, when a scout who who'd been watching him for several weeks, weeks approached Robinson. The scout offered Robinson a contract to play professionally with the Indianapolis ABCs. Robinson accepted the offer, but instead of joining the team midseason, waited until next, next season spring training to start. 
Robinson made his Negro League debut in 1925. Over the course of his 18-year career, Robinson played with 11 Negro League teams, including the Birmingham Black Barons, the Chicago American Giants, and the Memphis Red Sox. During those two years, Robinson also played against many of the best major league players. Robinson is particularly well known for his stellar defensive play, earning the nickname the Human Vacuum Cleaner. He is considered by many to be one of the greatest third basemen to ever play the game, Robinson retired from baseball in 1942. Today, I have the pleasure to talk to his grandson, Mr. Reverend Robbie Robinson. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. And, um, you know, it's it, as you read that, you know, it, it made me, you know, smile a lot to know that uh, things like that are written about uh, someone I was very close to, my granddad. But clearly when my granddad played, I think you said he retired in 1942, was well before I was born. So I never got to see uh, my, my grandfather play ball. But, you know, growing up around baseball and baseball players and growing up around him because he moved his family. Ultimately, when he retired, he moved his family to Chicago. And my dad, naturally being his son, came with him and uh, when he met my mom, who was from Chicago, you know, our family started. So I never got to play with my or see my granddad play, but always, you know, heard a lot of stories about him. There wasn't a lot written about, you know, the Negro League back in the day. So it was really interesting towards the end of his life is really when he started to to get, I would say, the recognition and the accolades that he probably deserved and, and as well as the others many years before. But I think the, the major um, league baseball organization recognized the contribution that the Negro League had made because you look at a lot of the players that, you know, came after them. A lot of the great players were uh, people that, you know, before only had the opportunity to play in the Negro League. But I remember vividly there was one of the All-Star games. I don't remember which one because I didn't go. But they invited the living uh, Negro League ball players to come to the All-Star game put on a really nice um, extravaganza for him, gave him a really nice jacket. And my dad, he did escort or go with his father, my grandfather, mm -hmm. and just told me it was, they really did it first class. They put them in the nicest hotels and just, it was just a really great experience for him to be at an all-star game and to get some recognition. But, you know, when I talked to my granddad about, you know, his life growing up and, and more than just baseball, but growing up, because I was always interested in what it was like to grow up in the South, because I grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, clearly uh, it was a, you know, racist, segregated environment that he grew up in. Uh, interestingly, mm -hmm. he said that, you know, as a young kid, though, you really didn't recognize or experience racism until you got to be a teenager. He said when they were young, you know, you could play with your next door neighbor. And he said, unlike Chicago, which was very segregated in terms of neighborhoods, still had <laughs> white people and black people living next door to one another where he grew up. Uh, and he said when they were kids, they played together and nobody thought anything about it. But once you got to be about 13 or so, all of a sudden, you know, your friend, you could no longer just call him Tommy. It was Mr. So-and-so. So that's when he started to experience it. But he started playing baseball um, when he was about 12 or 13. And, you know, have him tell it, he, you know, at that age, people knew that he was a, a step above most other kids his age. And he said, you know, a lot of the people in that area, you know, used to love to see him play ball. And he actually started out in the outfield. Um, but when he got to the professional level, and I think his first professional team was the Indianapolis ABCs, um, he ended up playing third base. And I don't know if you've got a picture. I've just got yeah. this particular picture up. I don't know if it shows up on the video. but uh, We can see it. OK, so this is, you know, one of the only pictures that I've got of him in his actual uniform. There are drawings that I've seen, you know, people have drawn. He's got a baseball card where someone has drawn uh, his image on it. But that's really the only one that I have with him in uniform. But, you know, he, he said that he had some good years. Uh, it was tough. Um, they played a lot of, you know, great ball players. Right. He played. He grew up with people like Satchel Paige. Uh, and Ted Double Duty Ratcliffe, who was really one of his good friends because he lived in Chicago, um, you know, later in life as my grandfather did. And they would go on these various tours around, you know, the cities promoting the Negro League and signing autographs and, you know, um, giving lectures and things like that. So he grew up around a lot of these ball players, but he just reminisces about, you know, his own experiences and how he, he really knew that if he were a white guy, he could have made it 
to the to the major leagues. Uh, he tells us a couple stories, but he told me one time, like Ty Cobb, who a lot of people see a lot of negative things about him being racist mm-hmm. and being a dirty player. Yes, I remember those stories. The way that my, my granddad described it, because he played against him. So my dad, granddad ended up playing with, with the Detroit team for a while, and I think Ty Cobb was playing for the Detroit Tigers at the time. So they would, you know, have barnstorming games uh, against one another. And he said that, you know, on the field, Ty Cobb was actually a gentleman. He was a nice mm-hmm. person on the field. He said he respected you if you had game and, and he gave you props. Now, once, you know, you're off the field, you know, you go your way, he go his way. But he said, you know, on the field, he really wasn't a bad human being. He said he played hard, but he didn't consider him dirty. He said, it, but the boy played hard. He played to win. He said, but I respected that. But the one story that my grandfather tells me, and I don't know who the manager of the Detroit Tigers were at the time, but my granddad's team was playing the Detroit Tigers. And at the end of the game, the manager came up to him, congratulated him on his play, but basically told my fa- grandfather, he said, if you were a white boy, you'd be my starting third base. He told him that. And it was good and bad. It was good from the standpoint that my granddaddy knew that he was good enough to make it and understood why he didn't make it. It had nothing to do with his, his talent and his ability, but it had everything to do with his race and color. So it was good from that standpoint that he knew in his heart that he was good enough to make it. But on the other hand, it was still a challenge that he wasn't able to, to make it in, you know, in that environment. So the way that he would kind of describe it is he really didn't have any regrets, but he just had wishes that, you know, were never able to be uh, manifested. So, you know, he, he loved baseball. Uh, my dad played a little bit of baseball. Um, but just, you know, wasn't as good out. My dad's younger brother, who was a, um, a pitcher, his name was Gene Robinson. He actually did sign later with the, um, the Giants, right? So, but my dad never made it uh, to the major leagues. But, um, you know, we grew up in a baseball family. I grew up loving baseball, playing baseball um, as a kid. And, um, you know, play semi-pro, but, you know, just never made it to the pro level. But, just, you know, I appreciate everything because of what my grandfather went through. But clearly at that day and age, again, because they didn't make a lot of money, he had to have a profession. When he was younger, you know, he got married, had a couple of kids. He had to decide in the off season whether he would go to Latin America to play ball or whether he would get a job. And some years he would do one and some years he would do the other. So some he would actually travel, which meant he was away from his family. Uh, other years he started picking up the trade of bricklaying. And ultimately, when he retired, that's what he stuck with being a bricklayer. And that's the trade he taught to my dad. And when they came to uh, Chicago, they both basically were, um, you know, brick masons. But my grandfather has been uh, inducted into the Mobile uh, Alabama Sports Hall of Fame, along with people like Hank Aaron, uh, Willie McCovey, Satchel Paige, Ted Double Duty Radcliffe, Billy Williams. Um, and people like Tommy Agee. So he is in that Hall of Fame, which was great. And fortunately, he was alive when they inducted him. So we went down to Mobile, and it was a really nice ceremony that they had for him. So he got to see, you know, some of his flowers while he was still here. Uh, He lived to be 99. I think he uh, was just short of 100 years when, you know, God called him on home. But, um, you know, he he had a great life, great career. And, you know, a great nickname, the human vacuum cleaner, which says that, you know, he, he, he can have it all. Hot corner. That's right. That mm-hmm. hot corner was his. And uh, he didn't he didn't make many mistakes there. So that's, you know, pretty much what I can tell you uh, about my grandfather. Man. Most of our kids, and I guarantee you, they don't realize what life was like in the South during that time. Mm-hmm. And I can go back to the past to talk to kids a little bit about my parents are both from Liberty, Mississippi. Okay. And I remember my Aunt Liz telling me a story about how and my Aunt Liz is 70 years old. Uh, and she told me a story about how she made a mistake and went to the front door of a white person in her town. Mm-hmm. So my grandfather, who I who I remember, who I met and was alive until I was in my 20s, uh, yelled at her and told her and screamed at her and told her, you can't go to the front door. You need to go to the back door. Yeah, um, my uh, my mother, who is sixty five, uh, is we can recall going to white and black water fountains in Liberty, Mississippi. Okay, 
often as a culture, we don't realize that racism and segregation, we think it's so long ago. It's like, no, I, mom was just at my house on, on Saturday, on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and so we forget that. Can you talk a little bit about if your grandfather ever talked to you about what it was like to be African-American in those Southern towns and what they had to endure for their love and their passion of baseball? Yeah, well, clearly, you know, they traveled. So in the Negro Leagues, you know, they had uh, teams in most major cities, you know, Detroit, Kansas City, Indianapolis. Um, you know, so when they would travel to those cities, clearly, uh, you know, they had to stay in certain places. So there were hotels that were um, the establishments, most, you know, pretty much all black owned that they would stay at those hotels. They would only eat at um, the restaurants where, you know, black people could eat. Um, you know, they would play the games. And, you know, a lot of times they would be heckled, you know, especially when they were doing the barnstorming. So, you know, most of their games were against other Negro League teams. So you really didn't have the issue there. Right. But when they had the, the, bar, the barnstorming games where they played some of the professional teams, naturally, they wanted to, to be at their best. Right. And so a lot of times, I mean, they were, were, was, would, would be killing the other teams and you would be like, wait, how can this be a professional team? This isn't even close. Right. But it's because, you know, they would be amped up. And in those environments, naturally, in the stands, you'd have on one side, you know, the black people on the other side, the, the white people. And it, it was a big difference, he said, in terms of how they reacted to you. And, you know, sometimes you really felt he felt, you know, concerned and threatened uh, and to the point where at some point in time, the manager would say, look, all right, we got to start easing up now. <laughs> OK, wait, come off you know, the gas a little bit. Let's just finish this game and let's get out of here alive kind of thing. So that was real. You know, he had to deal with that. But I, I guess it was such a way of life for him yeah. and people of that time that he just accepted that this is this is life. Right. So this this was their normal. Uh, whatever you and I experience today as our normal, that was their normal. And so as bad as it was, he didn't necessarily view it in any other way other than that this is how life is. Right. So he did have, you know, some of those experiences. Um, but again, mostly on the field with other players, most of the time it was fine. But, you know, like in the uh, Jackie Robinson movie, right, you'd have players um, that would, you know, be right, very, right. very racist and, and would say and do some things. But he said, you know, for the most part, they would play the game and it'd be the fans that he had to deal with more so than the players. Yeah. Um, the piece that I think that we don't realize is that speaking to what when you talked about what his world was very often when people talk about things like police brutality and black lives matter movement and things of that nature you know people you know some of our white brothers and sisters and our white colleagues sometimes like they're shocked when they hear of like our experiences mm -hmm. very often i tell people even as an educated african-american uh that with multiple degrees and tons of debt from his education <laughs> you still feel you still are subject to your feelings about the police as far as when you get pulled over you're feeling a fear and mm -hmm. a, uh and when you walk in i gave this story once and i was explaining to someone I, when i walked into a uh i was afraid because i had a hat on and i was afraid that oh i hope that people don't think i'm here to rob the subway right Unfortunately, that is regardless of your stature or your status in our country, uh, that is a truth for African Americans because we are very often viewed as negative or we are we are, you know, the, the stain of, of our country. Mm -hmm. Talk to can you talk to me about a little bit about the pride that your grandfather had about being a Negro League player? And what that meant, you know, during to you and your family and, and during that time. Yeah. So, again, like I said, you know, he played before I was born. But I would say mm -hmm. in, in the discussions that we had and my, my grandfather was a pretty gentle, quiet man, didn't do a lot of talking. Now, when you talk baseball or brickland, he, he'd talk a lot. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, he would just kind of sit around. But, you know, what he recognized is being a part of a Negro league for the average black person 
this was their group of celebrities, right? So you had the Negro League players, you had musicians, right? Because you really didn't have actors and actresses other than they playing slaves, right? So Mm -hmm. those group of people were reveled in terms of the black community. So when you came into a town, it was like, you know, the circus or, or, you know, it was like Michael Jordan and the bulls of, of that era coming in the town. So the people in the town, they welcomed you. The young kids, you know, would be looking up to you and, you know, with wide eyes. And from that perspective, he said it gave him a great bit of joy to understand. And not so much just from the selfish, you know, prideful, but the fact that he realized that he was able to do something that brought so much joy to a group of people that did not have a whole lot to look forward to most days of the week. But they could, in that environment, realize, hey, this is about people like me. I can let my hair down. I can say what I want to say. I can talk like I, I don't have to watch my language. I don't have to watch where I go. I don't have to watch where I sit. I can go and just do what I want to do for these couple of hours while this game is going on. So from that perspective, I think uh, he realized that, you know, there was a lot that he had to stand up for. And I think he made sure, at least for himself, that he tried to honor that because of he didn't want it to be a negative reflection on his people. Now, he'd be the first to tell you that there were, you know, a lot of ball players who, uh, you know, did a lot of crazy things, you know, would go after games, you know, go out drinking or partying, looking for the girls. For the most part, uh, at least he tells me now, you know, maybe he didn't want my grandmama to know, but he, he said for the most part, you know, he would come back to the hotel, him and a the couple, they'd eat some, some chicken, whatever they'd eat. They'd talk a little bit, play some cards, go to bed and get ready for the next day. Right. Um, so that's that's to me is how he saw himself in that era at that time. I think sometimes our kids don't realize the pride in seeing you. And what I mean is that when you see someone that looks like you and come from a similar community as you come from, you have a pride. Mm-hmm. Uh, that person knows the streets that I walked on. It's like, you know, a Chicagoan and Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. So Obama talks about knowing what the South side of Chicago looks like. You're saying to yourself, that guy, I walked in his footsteps in some way, shape or form. Uh, what our kids sometimes forget or not, they don't forget, they don't, maybe just don't realize that when you see some of our figures and you see them performing at the top of their profession, that is showing us that like we have the opportunity to make it just like they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we might not have the talent in that sport but, or that particular field, but I always, you know, make the point of like, so what is the Michael Jordan in you? So Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player ever, uh, mm-hmm. but we all have Michael Michael Jordan talent and ability in something. It's just about us finding out where it's at. Yeah, I agree. It's a, I agree. it's an absolute pleasure to hear about you know some of our figures, especially during this time when their when their their talent was suppressed and they seen and they played across the field in a league that they weren't allowed in. And they competed and they did and they and they destroyed them on the field, but they weren't allowed or seen as a similar or on the same basis as them. Absolutely. Is the part for our kids that, you know, I I hope that our kids take from this. Anything or do you have anything that you want to add or not? I mean, one thing and this, I'll be honest, came more from Billy Williams than it did from my granddad. But, you know, growing up in that same area. Something he said to me that really resonated. Sometimes we need to learn to appreciate what we have. It may not be much, but sometimes the the tough circumstances that you're in Mm -hmm. make you better. Right. He said what made him such a great hitter, right? They called him sweet swinging Billy. He -hmm. says, you know what made me a great hitter? He said, when I grew, grew up, we couldn't afford a baseball bat and a ball. So you know what I did? I had a broomstick. And people would throw bottle caps. Yeah. I learned how to hit bottle caps with a broomstick. He Mm -hmm. said, what do you think it looked like when I had a big baseball bat and a big ball? It looked like a watermelon coming up. Mm -hmm. I could hit it. It looked like it was a big watermelon. It was Mm -hmm. easy for me to hit. 
So he said what people don't realize is sometimes when you don't have something or don't have what other people have, you can use it and it can make you better and stronger. And I thought mm-hmm. about when I grew up, when I grew up in Chicago, we played on some of the worst little ghetto fields, yeah. you know, with broken glass and beer bottles and stuff. Rocks, right? The ball would hit on the infield. It bounce up, hit you in the bounce face. Up. Yeah. When we went to play on some of those suburban fields that were really manicured, oh man, that was easy. The ball was rolled smooth. Right. <laughs> Everything it was easy to play on that field. So sometimes, you know, your hardships can make you better. You just don't see it at the time. We don't see and we for, we don't realize how much we benefit and how much we benefit from those hardships. The thing I tell people, being an older person now, uh, I looked at the community that I grew up in. I grew up in an Inglewood community. Uh, okay. You know, and so I, and I remember that my block was a very supportive block where our neighbors cared about you. And our neighbors would tell mom, if you were doing something, you ain't have no business doing. Mm -hmm. And I remember in my, my most, the most thing I'm probably the most passionate about, as I say, the one thing we didn't have was, was money. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had structure. We had love. We had support. We had discipline. We had, we had expectations all the things that we had that really made us into what we became was the real things that we needed. The The one thing we didn't need, actually, is the materialism and the money and the shoes and all that other stuff that didn't matter. Uh, and so sometimes our kids don't realize the blood and sweat and tears that have put in for the progression of African-Americans. That's sometimes the inspiration that we need. We're right looking for other outlets or social media or our friends security. No, what we need to see is we need to see all the other African-Americans and all the other hardworking people in our society that have worked their tails off to get to where they are, despite the odds, despite the challenges, despite all of the things that have the roadblocks that have been put in our way. We've persevered and we've gotten to a point where we can be vocal, you know, and we can really push on what our country is and to get the best out of our country. And, mm-hmm. and I always remind, you know, some of our some of our young people is that there has not been really, there have been some social movement, the most impactful culture that has impacted our American culture and American rights have been black folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, Right. We have pushed civil rights for all. We have made people talk about what is fair for one is fair for everyone. We have pushed that dialogue, and that is something that we should honestly be proud of and celebrate. Absolutely. Absolutely. So do you have anything else you want to add for us? I know we had about 30 minutes. I don't yeah. know more of your time. <laughs> I appreciate you honoring my time. You know something? The only thing I would say, uh, Principal Croson, is, is one thing I remember talking to my granddad about about Jackie Robinson, because I wanted to know his view, how much he knew about Jackie. Now, Jackie was younger than my Mm -hmm. grandfather, so he never played with him, but he knew who he was and, you know, the playing in the Negro Leagues and things like that. And so I asked him, I said, Pops, that's what we used to call him. I said, Pops, was Jackie Robinson the best player of his day? And my grandfather being, you know, a wise Man, he, he he paused for a moment. He kind of re- looked up and like, let me think about it. Let me get my thoughts together. And he basically said this. He said he wasn't the best player that we had, but he was the right player for that time. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I just like to leave you. Sometimes, you know, young people uh, and all people, old people as well as young people, you know, we, we figure, you know, we need to try to be the best of, of all time. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, it's not that you're the very best, but maybe you're the right person for that time. Mm-hmm. And that's what, to me, how I try to live my life now. I'm, I don't, I'm a preacher, right? I don't have to be the best preacher, but I need to be the right preacher for the right time. Right. And whatever you are in life, you need to be the right principal for the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and if we can do that, and if young people can understand that and strive to be the best they can be and don't worry about if they're the best ever, we'll be all right. Mm-hmm. The greatest competition is that the competition within yourself. There you go. There you go. So kids very often think they have to compete with everyone. It's like, no, I want to be the best me that I can. And if I be Absolutely. the best me that I can, I'll, I'll take care of people around me. 
So absolutely. Absolutely. Mr. Robinson, Reverend Robinson, we appreciate your time. Anytime you want to have this conversation, we can, <laughs> I can tell you about, you know, my love for, for Andre Dawson and all. Okay. Uh, was the first player that I actually like loved. Uh, I started out as a Cub fan, but then I switched to the Sox. <laughs> so I can tell those secrets too. Hopefully nobody looks at this video. No. <laughs> Blackmail me on it. But yes, so anytime you, you want to have a discussion or you want to come to Elgin, you are welcome. Uh, we appreciate this time and we, we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts. All right, well, I'm so grateful that Virginia, thank you for reaching out to me. I'm grateful that this time worked out for me as you and you as well. And uh, is it nice that your birthday? Is that what we're celebrating? It was something. No, it's okay. not my birthday. It's, 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 it's like Black History, History Month. Month okay. And I just absolutely, and they know I love baseball. Okay. About it all night long. Uh, we're looking forward to a good sock season this year. Uh, <laughs> I love player. And, and I, I just, it's just a passion that I have. It's one of the few uh, addictions that I have outside of, of work. So. Okay. Well, good, good, good. Well, you know, tell you what, one day I'm going to, you know, once, once we get past it through this COVID thing, I'll invite, uh, set up something where you can at least meet Billy Williams. He's a, he's a great guy. He, my dad passed um, in December. I, on, on Sorry the, to hear that. 9th of December. So uh, Billy Williams spoke at his, we did a, a virtual memorial mm -hmm. and Billy spoke, did really well. So uh, I told him we'll get together once we get past this COVID thing, but I'll try to raise something, man, where you can meet him. It will be an absolute pleasure to meet Billy Williams. Absolutely. Pleasure in Absolutely. Life and in a memory that I cherish for the rest of my life. All right. I'll, I'll make sure we, we try to make that happen. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Reverend Robinson. Have a good God bless you all. Take care. Thank you.